In Fallout 3, there are many places to find and explore. The Capital Wasteland seems to have something neat around almost every corner, and we can see one of the more interesting areas around the north end of the map. Oasis is a lush wonderland that sticks out like a sore thumb in the wasteland, as does the settlement's resident god figure, Harold. The FEV ghoul hybrid has come a long way from the west coast and simply wants to die by the time we meet him in Fallout 3. Of course, we can help Harold with his wish, as many options are given to finish the quest he gives us. Still, one hidden option is not only the easiest way to get bad karma, but it can also be the most fun. If we have a flamer or similar weapon in our inventory, note that not all flame weapons will work when burning Harold, still, when we have one that does, we can light him ablaze, bringing him to his goal of death immediately, which is accompanied by some terrible screams from the ghoul. <laughs> What some players may have missed is that when we come back to Harold after doing this, his character model will have changed to a charred, burnt, and twisted version of his former self. Just some more great attention to detail that Bethesda added to Fallout 3. In Fallout 4, the most significant settlement we can find is in the remnants of Fenway Park, Diamond City. Among the multitude of side quests we can find here, one can change 200 years of tradition if done improperly. Speaking with Abbott at the wall, we can start the quest painting the town. This involves heading to the old hardware store down the road and finding some paint for the wall. Once we get to Hardware Town, some raiders will launch a clever scheme to ambush the sole survivor, but after the attack, we can find some paint and a mixer in the rear of the room. Here, we can mix yellow and blue paint to make green, but we can also take these base colors back to Diamond City. Once we are back at the wall, use one of these colors to paint the wall with, and we will be confronted by Abbott. Hey, Abbott. Blue? You know what you're doing there? The wall ain't blue. I think it'll look good. Well, let's hope so. I guess it's better than her going into disrepair, but... Damn. That's over 200 years of tradition we're moving away from. There's your payment. Now get going! I got work to do. Returning to the wall a bit after doing the quest, we will see that Abbott has painted the entire thing to match whatever color we have used, blue or yellow. We can't use the blood can or the red paint added with the DLCs in the quest, so these are the only colors we can change the wall to. This is just an interesting small detail that people tend to miss due to using the correct paint during the quest. Still, if you want to change up Diamond City, this is one of the biggest ways to do it. Thank you to Rex from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout New Vegas, we can meet the people of the Mojave. While not all of them are the friendly type, one of the most beloved can be found as soon as we start our journey. Doc Mitchell is the resident medicine man of Good Springs, and he spends his time patching people up and tending to his home. Though times seem good for Mitch now, that wasn't always the case, and if we do some traveling, we can piece together his story. Doc Mitchell is from Vault 21, and if we visit the vault on the strip and speak with Sarah, we can get a bit more info about the Good Springs doctor. Mitch? You mean Molebutt? I hadn't thought about that name in a long time. I was just a child and he had a big mole in his rear bumper. You understand, kids and all that. Everyone knows about each other in a vault. There's no other way. I hope Mole, I mean, Mitch, is doing well. If we head back to Doc Mitchell after speaking with Sarah, we can ask him about being from Vault 21. He will then reveal the saddest part of his story. Yep, he sure did. Wanted himself a hotel, and to make sure once he made the change, there'd never be any going back. We didn't get a say. I don't know how you'd argue with a fella like that anyways, everywhere and nowhere all at once. So, just like that, we was all homeless. Went our separate ways, and that was all she wrote. Eventually, we made our way out here, but, uh, well... When folks spend their lives in isolation, sometimes that ain't the best of things for learning to fight off germs. We was going to California, but Good Springs was as far as we got. After she passed, was no reason to keep going. I stayed so I could keep close to her. 
In Fallout New Vegas, we can find many different nuclear-powered bugs and creatures. One of the best among them are the mantis that we can find in various spots around the Mojave. If you happen to find some mantis, make sure to look for their eggs. If we shoot them, it will break the clutch and release the baby mantids into the world. If you aren't doing this in every playthrough, you are doing mankind a great disservice. Big thanks to Dr. Doctor from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we find the marvelous Tinpenny Tower, named after Alistair Tinpenny. He found the building in the wasteland and hired enough people to turn it into a community. One person not allowed in Tinpenny Tower is Roy Phillips, a ghoul. He wants entry into the Elita settlement, but is repeatedly denied. Tinpenny's guards wish the ghoul and his friends dealt with but we can talk to Roy to get his side of the story. We can get rather unique dialogue through Roy that most players miss due to how the game is presented. Suppose we side with Roy and allow him to release feral ghouls into Tenpenny Tower before dealing with the bomb in Megaton. In that case, we can also side with Burke and rig the nuke to blow. When we return to Tenpenny Tower, we will see Roy and Burke form an unlikely friendship due to our choices. Look, Burke, I, I don't care how you got past the others. I could... I could have you torn apart in an instant with a snap of my fingers. Is that so? Do it then, Phillips. Set your feral pets upon me. I could use a bit of sport. After I've dealt with them, I'll turn my attention to you. After all, you've destroyed my home, murdered my employer. I've got something of a score to settle, wouldn't you say? Hey, now come on. The old man got what he had coming. Look, maybe we can work something out. You said you just have some uh, business to conclude? Correct. You and your friends may have killed Tenpenny, but the man gave me a task, and I intend to complete it. There's a detonator on the balcony. When that switch is activated, the bomb at the center of Megaton goes boom. That will conclude my business. Holy shit. You're gonna blow up Megaton? No lie. Look, Bert, if you're about to burn down that smooth skin shithole, I ain't gonna stop you. In fact, I. Well, I think it's fair to say you'd be quite welcome around here. So, what do you say? You do your thing and we let bygones be bygones. All right. Water under the bridge, then. Truth be told, I'm a, a firm believer in natural selection. What you people did here was inspired. All right then, Burke, uh, uh, Mr. Burke, I'll let you get to it. And um, thanks for your uh, understanding. Thank you to Arctic Penguin and many others for suggesting this on the Discord server. In Fallout New Vegas, the first location the courier will land is Good Springs. Typically, the player would talk to the people around town and find out what they can do to help them start their Mojave journey. The settlement has a ton of skill checks, making it a fun way to test your early build in the game, but we can have some fun if we are more prepared. One of the things that can be easily overlooked in this area is a chemistry set inside Doc Mitchell's house that can be interacted with. If the courier has a high enough science skill, various chems or a handful of stim packs can be crafted, which is an excellent boost at any point in Fallout New Vegas. Inside the Good Springs store, Chet runs a tight ship. He is perhaps the least interested in getting into a gunfight with the Powder Gangers. Of course, there is a skill check to convince the shopkeep, but if you happen to have Chet's suggested amount of caps on you, you can offer that to him as well. New Vegas is filled with small details and alternate ways to approach quests like this, making it fun and interesting to try new ways to handle things in each playthrough. Now just hold on, I never voted to take on the Powder Gangers. That's a thousand cap investment you're talking about. That's more like it. The people can pick up their extra ammo and leather armor when they're ready. Was there anything else? In Fallout 3, there's a tremendously big wasteland to explore in the former capital of the old US of A. 
Still, likely the first place we all encountered after leaving the vault was Megaton, a settlement built out of the shells of old airplanes that hosts an undetonated atomic bomb as a city center. Lucas Sims is the acting sheriff of the town, spending his free time taking care of the mayoral duties, so it is safe to say Sims is a capable man and it would seem the people of Megaton, for the most part, love and respect him. And if we chat with him after entering Megaton, we can start to see why. Sheriff Sims is an excellent judge of character and will have different unique dialogue depending on the player's karma level. Each karma level is paired, meaning very good and good get the same reaction, as do the evil ranks. Though strangely, Sims will salute a very evil or evil character at the beginning of the conversation. This does not happen with neutral or above. Name's Lucas Sims, town sheriff, and mayor too, when the need arises. You've got a weird look about you, boy. The kind that means trouble. I give everyone a fair shake, but if you do anything remotely stupid, you're dead. Name's Lucas Sims, town sheriff, and mayor too, when the need arises. Name's Lucas Sims, town sheriff, and mayor too, when the need arises. I don't know why, but I like you, boy. Something tells me you're all right. So welcome to Megaton. Just holler if you need something. In Fallout New Vegas at Black Mountain, we find the prison building, which holds Raul, a possible companion for the courier. Just outside his room, we can see this toy car, which at first glance doesn't seem like anything special. If we look through the terminal on the same table, we can see some logs from the ghoul prisoner that shed some light on this car. It belonged to a night kid named Cuddles, who was very persistent to Raul about getting it fixed, going as far as to bring gas to help with the project, a significant feat in the Fallout universe. Raul was either not interested in the project or couldn't fix the toy, which led to Cuddles attacking the ghoul and Tabitha killing the nightkin to save the only mechanic she had access to. After reading through these entries, the toy car will now be renamed Cuddles Toy Car, making it quite the unique item for hunters like myself. But that isn't the only one we can find. At the Long 15, we can find another Cuddles Toy Car, next to a standard variant. These are out of reach by normal means and would require no clipping to collect them, so we can count the one found at Black Mountain as a unique item. One man's failed project is another man's treasure. Thank you to House from the Discord server for suggesting this one. Fallout New Vegas held the record for most dialogue recorded in a video game at the time of release. That's quite the feat. Judging how much unique dialogue we find in the game, it's not hard to believe. Some of these interactions can be found by pointing your gun at various companions that you can recruit in your adventures around the Mojave. How about I aim my gun at you for a while, see how you like it? Why do we always hurt the ones we care about the most? I assure you, you look extremely virile. Now, would you mind pointing that somewhere else? Thanks. Don't like no one drawing a bead on me. Leo doesn't like that, dearie. You should stop. You, uh... You wanna point that someplace else, boss? I got enough holes in me. In the Fallout 3 DLC Mothership Zeta, the Lone Wanderer is abducted by aliens and brought to their mothership. Friendships are formed, and with the help of other captives aboard the ship, we fight our way through the Zayton crew and uncover great stories along the way. Once all the generators are destroyed, we will be tasked with using the spacesuit to do a spacewalk to get to the ship's upper deck. While we can have some fun with unique deaths here by not wearing the spacesuit in decompressed areas, there is another fantastic animation that only plays here. If the lone wanderer strays too close to the ship's edge, we will see them float away in probably the most unique death animation in Fallout 3. Environmental experiences like this are always fun to see, and it would be great to have more things like this moving forward in the Fallout series. In Fallout New Vegas, we can come across the Sunset Sarsaparilla headquarters. Guarded by Ol' Festus and a few Patektrons, this location acted as a bottling plant and operating facility for the pre-war drink. Still, after all these years, a beloved employee remains. Inside the maintenance closet, we can find Mr. Janitor. This Mr. Handy model was used to clean the building before the Great War, and he is still in remarkable condition. Hacking the average locked terminal on the other side of the room will allow us to start Mr. Janitor's routine. 
this can be quite rewarding for people who have the patience to let him finish his job. The robot will begin making rounds through the Sunset Sarsaparilla HQ, visiting rooms and cleaning up all that he can find. After his route is finished, he will stop at a garbage can and empty all he collected, wishing farewell to the rubbish. This being a bottling plant, most of what Mr. Janitor has picked up consists of caps, the currency of the wasteland. He will deposit a random amount of caps into the trash can, still, the number is usually decently high, so this is a great way to get a nice boost when you make it to this area, and Mr. Janitor is happy to do the heavy lifting for you. In Fallout New Vegas, just outside of Novak, we can find Gibson's Scrapyard, along with the owner, Old Lady Gibson. Gibson has become a fan favorite over the years, and her services are often used to saw off the copious amount of junk found in the Mojave. If the courier was to take Old Lady Gibson out for some reason though, they would find quite the nice reward waiting for them, as we can loot a unique sawed-off shotgun called Big Boomer from her person. This gun has a one-of-a-kind design with the words Big Boomer emblazoned on the grip, and the shotgun has more damage than its standard counterparts. It's actually a pretty decent weapon to use. We can also find some in-game files that show an unused texture for the Big Boomer, making it look more similar to Fallout 3's sawed-off shotguns. Whatever the case, many people don't kill Old Lady Gibson to grab this piece, but this is the wasteland. You will need all the help you're gonna get. In Fallout New Vegas, near the Nipton rest stop and past the plane crash, we can find a location many players miss during their playthroughs, the Scorpion Burrow. Up top, we can find a bunch of rad scorpions, and below it's not much different. Among those in the burrow itself, we can find a rad scorpion queen. This is one of two locations where we can find a queen, the other being the searchlight fire station. After dealing with the queen, we can find a few poor souls that couldn't stand the scorpions down here. Some, like a prospector with good loot, and others with strange loot like a wastelander with some Sierra Madre chips. The Fallout series is filled with hidden locations that lie just off the beaten path. This easily missable nest of hellbugs is an excellent example of how some of them can be hiding in plain sight. In Fallout 4, while in Diamond City, one of the places we can visit is the All Faiths Chapel. This is a small gathering place for people of all faiths to relax and spend some time with whatever religion they subscribe to, hence the name. After entering the building and speaking with the pastor, if we sit down on the pew, we will receive the Quiet Reflection perk which will boost earned experience points by 5% for 8 in-game hours. The perk doesn't stack with well-rested or lover's embrace, still it is a nice XP boost for just sitting down in the chapel, and it's always nice to have some quiet reflection. In Fallout 3, we find ourselves in the depths of Vault 101, growing up and learning the ways of the vault. The introduction to Fallout 3 can be pretty straightforward, guiding the player through various events which can lead to some things being missed. One of the best examples of this is when we are given the BB gun from James and tasked with hitting the targets. Most players just follow the directions, either getting through this bit as quickly as possible or outright following the game's path. If we run out of BBs during this bit, we can get some unique dialogue from James and some more insight into the Rad Roach. Don't worry, you'll get the hang of it. Here are some more BBs. If you're having trouble, try crouching to steady your aim. Hey, shoot at the targets, okay? That's not a toy. Having trouble with that red roach? Nasty little things. They pretty much keep to dark places, though. That's why there are always lights on in the vault. I know you can, and that's good. I'm not always going to be here to take care of you. You've got to learn to fend for yourself. Now, take your time, breathe slowly, sight down the barrel, and squeeze the trigger. Something wrong? That rad roach is still over there. Out already? Something wrong with the sights on that thing. Here you go, son. Thank you to Joe Splash from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout New Vegas, one of the factions we have to deal with is the Brotherhood of Steel, a now hermit group living in Hidden Valley. After helping the underground dwellers significantly, we will have the option to join the faction outright, which offers the Power Armor training perk, allowing the courier to wear power armor. This isn't the only place we can get this perk though. If we have done work with the Enclave Remnants, they will offer the same reward. This lets us know how to use power armor before getting the training from Elder McNamara, who will be pretty surprised about an outsider having this know-how. 
Would you like to tell me where you learned such a thing? No, don't bother. A person as well-traveled as yourself is bound to pick up all kinds of skills, I suppose. Luckily, that's not all I have for you. I've also given the order that all of our equipment be made available to you, not just the more mundane arms. You're a member of the Brotherhood now, and your gear should reflect that. Lastly, you will be allowed to come and go as you please. You've done so much for us that to do otherwise would be a crime. I just ask that you keep the Brotherhood's interests at heart in all your dealings. Remember that you will always have a home here. This doesn't give us the option to tell the Brotherhood about the Enclave forces that still remain. Still, it is a cool, unique dialogue that can be triggered. Not all power armor in New Vegas requires this training though, as we can see with the NCR. We can find NCR salvaged power armor on heavy troopers. Even in the Ranger's safe house, these armor sets do not require this perk because they no longer count as powered armor after being salvaged by the NCR. With the jury rigging perk, we can even repair these with sets of heavy armor that are more common, like metal armor. Thank you to Daddy Harambe and Euro from the Discord server for suggesting this one. Also, make sure to check the links in the description to join the server yourself or to follow me on apps like Twitter and Instagram. Fallout New Vegas is renowned for player choice and spoken dialogue, with many lines hidden behind certain stat and skill checks. We can find one in Freeside that some players may miss due to the low intelligence required and because it's interlaced with Veronica's companion quest. We will need to speak to this vagrant to find the rangefinder Veronica is looking for. Typically, the NPC will mutter incoherently and not make much sense, even when you open his dialogue. <laughs> huh? Kids run by sometimes. With a low intelligence character, we can find some unique dialogue here. The Vagrant will now be speaking very well and with an enhanced vocabulary. Friend, not a few minutes ago I chanced upon a pair of destitute orphans grappling over just such an item. If you cover the area methodically, I'm quite certain you'll happen upon them with only the most insubstantial of delays. Be well, and do try and avoid the tragic path of the sot that led me to my present infirmities and spiritual woes. Fare thee well. This is likely a callback to Fallout 2, where a low intelligence chosen one could get similar dialogue once they meet Tor and help the tribal guard his Brahmin from rad scorpion attacks. The dialogue will change to show that these two smooth brains can understand each other much more than someone with average or above average intelligence. This is peak Fallout humor, and moving forward with the series, I would love to see more dialogue changes based on intelligence stats. In Fallout 4, one of the tallest buildings in downtown Boston is Mass Fusion, and if we find ourselves on the roof of this majestic skyscraper, there's quite a view to take in. Once you are done soaking in the whole of the Commonwealth from above, there is quite a fun way to get down that I use almost every time I find myself up there. If you have to go to Good Neighbor, it's my favorite way to get there. Simply jump from this corner and you will be hurtling towards the settlement. Before we hit the ground though, the loading screen will act as an amazing net catching us before we actually hit the ground and causing no damage. In my opinion, this is the absolute best way to enter Good Neighbor. In Fallout New Vegas, one of the more striking locations that we can find is the Searchlight area. Searchlight proper was victim to a chemical attack from the Legion, which has decimated the NCR in the small city. One of the more exciting things we can find is at the fire station, lying between the two parked fire trucks. The training dummy looks like a dead NPC. In fact, I'm not entirely sure it's not since we can use the cannibal perk on it and even resurrect him. Most people believe this to be a pre-war model used to train the firefighters in the area. But who's to say it's not just a dead NPC named Training Dummy that managed to get caught up in the attack at Searchlight. Either way, the damn thing has always creeped me out, but make sure to pay our boy a visit during your next playthrough. In Fallout 3, we are thrust into a wasteland filled with horrors around every corner. Something as simple as a bottle of water can seem like a timeless treasure. Still, wanderers should check the liquids they decide to drain into their bellies. Towards the end of the main quest, we will get an audience with the president of the Enclave, John Henry Eden. President Eden will propose that the lone wanderer take a vial of modified FEV to put into the water supply when starting Project Purity. Eden promises this concoction will purify the waste by eliminating mutants and ghouls, purging them from existence. Still, people like the lone wanderer will be immune to the FEV's effects. This, however, isn't exactly the case. 
If you choose to spike the water and you have broken steel installed, you will be able to find boxes of Aqua Pura out in the capital wasteland. If we drink it, the game will warn us that it will be fatal. Continuing consumption, the lone wanderer drops dead from the effects. This is terrific attention to detail that drives home the consequences of the choices we made at Project Purity. for it? I, I don't have any caps or anything. I can just have it? For free? Really? Thank you. You're the first person willing to actually give me any of that. In Goat Simulator 3, we can find a ton of easter eggs and pop culture references. The game even starts with a terrific take on the Skyrim introduction. Hey, you're finally awake! I'm your new owner. I will look back at you, but I need to look at a road. This is not the only reference to a Bethesda series that we can find either, as we can find an incredible Fallout Easter egg among the suburban homes outside of Gothenburg. Coming to this area on the map, we can find a water tower that has scientists nesting at the top, with a quest called the Big Red Button becoming active. Going into the tower, if we start pressing buttons, we will see a cutscene showing a familiar looking bomb head in our way, which lands in the center of a cul-de-sac, and then we can finally check it out for ourselves. Running up to the bomb, we can headbutt it, which will cause it to detonate, leaving a crater in this once beautiful neighborhood. This rewards us with the Fallout Boy gear, a vault jumpsuit with the number 55 on it. Oddly enough, and perhaps unbeknownst to the dev team at Coffee State North, Vault 55 has been mentioned in the Fallout lore before, but only in the now non-canon Fallout Bible. The vault would remove all entertainment media from the dwellers in an experiment to see how that would affect the population. After the explosion, NPCs will mutate in the area, growing limbs randomly on their body. This is a wonderful Fallout Easter egg, and it was indeed a welcome surprise in this fun and unique world provided by Goat Simulator 3. In Fallout 3, we can find many items that'll help us on our journey through the Capital Wasteland and some that don't do much of anything at all. Whatever the case, there are plenty of things for the Lone Wanderer to collect. The heaviest item in the game is also one of the most useless, the Wood Chipper, found sporadically throughout the Wasteland. This item uses the same model as the Leaf Blower, with the massive difference being its weight, sitting at an astounding 50 pounds. The same is true for Fallout New Vegas, where the Wood Chipper tops the scales as the heaviest item in game as well weighing more than power armor sets and doing pretty much nothing of use. It's always interesting to find which items are the heaviest or lightest, and it's no surprise that a wood chipper would be the top of the mountain. I'm surprised that we can even add it to our inventory, but perhaps the back pain isn't worth collecting these when we see them on our adventures. In Fallout 4, one of the best companions to have is Dogmeat, the German Shepherd we find at the Red Rocket gas station just outside Sanctuary. Our canine companion is essential to the story and Fallout 4 has a hilarious way with dealing with the player missing that first encounter with him. In order to progress the main quest, we have to find Nick Valentine and search for Kellogg. I learned while filming this video that if you haven't been to Diamond City before you head there with Nick, the door will be open, Piper won't be locked out like usual, she will instead already be in an argument with McDonough. Once inside Diamond City, we inform Nick about what happened at the vault, and he gets a raging clue to go check out Kellogg's house. After searching through the home, Nick will say he needs to bring his best man on the case, and what happens next is a pretty funny way to force the player to meet Dogmeat. Hmm, interesting brand. Won't lead us anywhere on its own, though. What? The great clockwork dick is stumped? It's synth, Detective Jackass. If you're gonna be that way, you might as well get the make and model right. Joking aside, I got an idea. I need to call someone in. A uh, specialist. Who's this friend of yours, Nick? Worked with him a few times, but he only likes certain people. Got a feeling you'll get on, though. You'll meet soon enough. Gonna send out the signal. It's a special frequency, so you won't hear it. But he will. Okay, I called him. Let's wait outside.
you get to work, dog meat? If all I needed was a dog, why'd I bother saving you? Just consider getting me out of that vault of finders, V. Give dog meat a whiff of that cigar, see if he picks up the trail. In High on Life, we take the role of a human warped into an alien world and thrust into a role as a bounty hunter, shooting our way through hordes of funky spacemen and exploring the world offered in High on Life is a real treat, but so is the trademark humor of developer Squanch Games. While a lot of the funny bits come from the hilarious voice acting and visual gags in the game, we can unlock an achievement that pays homage to the Fallout series in one of the darkest yet funniest ways possible. After heading towards the slums, we can come across a kid that likes to run his mouth. I'm Slumsley. Hey, fresh meat! Fresh meat, guess what? I got my GED while you were gone. I'm going to community college! When we try to shoot at him, our gun, Kenny, will stop us with some moral objections. Whoa, 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 what are you doing? Come on, he's just a kid. D don't shoot him. Oh, you don't want to shoot- I am not shooting a kid. If we try enough times though, we will successfully shoot the kid, leading to some funny dialogue and an achievement called Fallout Doesn't Let You Do This. You <laughs> Shoot me. Hey, you shot me, I'm dead. Hey. All right there, are you happy now? Well, I, I didn't think we'd be allowed to kill him. Yeah, normally killing children in games isn't, isn't allowed, but he's dead. We killed this kid. Are, are you happy now? We killed the kid. The kid is dead now. There goes our E for everybody rating. This is an excellent reference to the fact that the classic Fallout games patched out killing the child NPCs around the wasteland and further stretching into the Bethesda titles where children are immune to damage. This is a fun jab at the Fallout series in an absolutely fantastic game. In Fallout 3, one of the rundown buildings we can come across is the Nuka-Cola plant. Filled with Protectrons and nasty nuka lurks, it's no surprise that we can find the remains of Winger Mercier here with a note on him that explains that he is looking for the Nuka Clear formula. Locating Milo helps here, as we can convince the robot that we are Brad Burton himself with a bit of speechcraft, allowing us administrative access and a copy of the research safe key. This key will open a safe in the research office that holds the coveted Nuka Clear formula. While this can be used in the Nuka Cola Challenge quest, we are looking at what happens when we go to the Red Racer factory after obtaining it. Mercier's friends will accost the Lone Wanderer and introduce themselves as Sudden Death Overtime a remnant of what they believe pre-war hockey players represent, with their names even referencing famous real-world athletes. Hold it right there! What are you doing here? Mercier didn't make it? Damn! How do they expect us to play when we don't even have enough people on our team? Well, as long as you brought the formula, I guess we're still in the game. The name's Goli Ledoux, and I'm captain of Sudden Death Overtime, the last of the ice gangs. There was a time where every city had their own ice gangs, and thousands would show up to watch them all duke it out in giant arenas. We aim to bring those days back. That's up to you. We can make a deal, or we can face off. I'm putting 250 caps up on the scoreboard. What do you say? Nicely played. And I know talent when I see it. Here you go. Okay, team. Let's get out of here. Stuff like this is what gives Fallout so much charm. The people of this world find things from the past and interpret them the only way they know how. This raider gang thinking that all hockey teams used to meet in arenas and fight it out inspired their lifestyle. It's just a shame we couldn't get a unique hockey stick weapon out of this. In Fallout New Vegas, one of the most ignored areas in the Mojave are the sewers that run underground across the Vegas area. Home to giant rats, ghouls, and aggressive humans, it makes sense so many people avoid the dank underbelly of the city. This doesn't mean that good things can't be found in the sewers, as if we locate Luke here in the central area, we can find a key known as Luke's Find. This key can also be found here in the East Central Sewers on Jill. The key will open the door to the sealed sewers, which leads to a chamber guarded by a large group of ghouls, but lying amongst them is a prospector that has exactly what we are looking for. The Humble Cudgel is a unique lead pipe with a decent damage boost. 
The pipe is in much better condition than its standard counterpart, and it features a T-split that almost mimics a hammer. The best part of this unique pipe is the special attack that comes with it, called Lights Out. You can perform this move by moving forward and doing a power attack, or by choosing it in VATS. This will do 125% damage and has amazing results. So the cudgel is a must have for any melee builds. In a previous short, I showed a clip of this location and got a few questions about it, so let's take a look. In Fallout 3, much like other games from Bethesda, there are a plethora of unused areas and map cells that still exist in the game. One of the most exciting locations you can't get to in Fallout 3 is the Test QA World Rock Creek Estates. We enter this cell by using the console command COC QA World Origin. This map is so interesting to me because we never see such a dense burnt forest in the game, and the vibe is perfect for the Fallout universe. Taking inspiration from the real world Rock Creek Park, this is a sprawling demo cell with a few Mirelurks and Hunters roaming the area. In fact, it's believed that Grandma Sparkle's boys could have been placed here. While we can't enter any of the doors here, there is a cave entrance next to the Mirelurks and a house perched perfectly to watch over the canyon. Winding roads spread from the creek base and presumably would have led to the other areas around DC. The dense trees and shallow creek bed offer an excellent looking fallout location and it's great that we can see what the devs were thinking by visiting places like this. Thank you to Duck from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout New Vegas, my favorite of the minor factions that we can meet are the Kings. As a lifelong fan of Elvis Presley, it was a joy to see a faction dedicated to his character and memory in the game. If we go to the King's School of Impersonation, we can find a few unique things, some I have covered in past videos. Still, if we talk to the resident hairdresser for this group of cats, we can obtain one of the most easily missable melee weapons in Fallout New Vegas. On the first floor of the school, we can find Sergio. Sergio cuts hair for the group and is highly recommended by the king himself if the courier earns their spot with the faction. However, the gang will not turn hostile if we take matters into our own hands and attack the barber. This is the fastest and easiest way to get Figaro, the unique switchblade. While the blade itself is beautiful, it's certainly not the best weapon you will find in New Vegas, but it is often missed due to a bug within the game. On consoles, where many people enjoy the Fallout series, Sergio often doesn't spawn. Since console commands are exclusive to PC, it will lead to Figaro being impossible to obtain. So if you are a unique item hunter and you're looking for a great knife to go with your new greaser look in the wasteland, make sure to stop by the Kings and pay Sergio a visit. In Fallout 3, there is much to do in the Capital Wasteland. Whether you are chasing down your runaway dad or just taking a stroll through the vast wasteland Washington DC has become, there is always something a wanderer can do to pass the time. One of the most useless interactions in the game comes from an object most people just run right past without thinking twice about it. We can find a good number of parking meters in Fallout 3, with the most residing at Jury Street Metro, and we can interact with all of them. Usually, these meters show an expired time tag, which all adds up since these haven't been appropriately used since before the war. Still, approaching the meters and interacting with them will start a timer and cause the machine to lower the expired tag. This is perhaps the most useless interaction in Fallout 3. In Fallout New Vegas, the Mojave is filled with cruel raiders, vicious creatures, and superb locations that can turn any courier into a hardened warrior in no time. Amongst everything we can find, many valuable items wait to be taken, and some of the most expensive we don't even have the option to sell. The item with the most value in all of Fallout New Vegas is the disassembled weapons shipment guarded by the Fiends, which holds a value of 5,000. This is only used in a quest, but I thought it was worth mentioning in this video. Two stand out when it comes to the most valuable non-quest items. The first is virtually unobtainable due to being cut from the final game, the Mantis Scythe Schematics. With a value of 800, they stand at the top of the most valuable miscellaneous items in the game. Well, in this case, cut from the game. Using console commands, we can spawn the schematics. Still, they will be added as a Deathclaw Gauntlet resource note instead of their original purpose, which was to allow the courier to craft the Mantis Gauntlet. Regarding non-quest miscellaneous items in Fallout New Vegas, the most valuable one we can find can't even be sold for its cap value. Cook Cook's Fiend Stew Recipe. With a value of 400, this is the most expensive item in the game, not counting weapons and armor, of course. The item immediately gets added as a note to our Pip-Boy, preventing us from selling it. While Cook Cook is known for his skill in the kitchen, after defeating the raider boss, we can harness this power for ourselves. Nothing beats a good stew, even if it's over 100 degrees in the post-war Mojave. In Fallout 4, when we encounter ladders, they usually lead to a new area with a loading screen, or they are just a static decoration. 
with no real way to interact with them. Still, while in the Mechanist layer, we can find a ladder that seems to break this rule. Around the Robobrain area, we can find a ladder in front of some filing cabinets next to the brain storage room. Walking into this ladder will allow us to ascend it unlike any other in-game, as far as I know. Of course, if you know of any similar ladders in Fallout 4, hit the comments with their location. Strangely, this isn't a feature in the Fallout universe and it only shows up once in a Fallout 4 DLC. Still, for whatever reason, this seems to be the only climbable ladder in Fallout 4. Thank you to Kata the Leopard from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In the Fallout New Vegas DLC Dead Money, the courier is brought to the Sierra Madre Resort and Casino, fitted with a bomb collar, and forced to work with a pack of characters in order to make a grand escape. Plenty of things stand in our way, the ghost people who call the area home, various traps, and a thick poisonous cloud that can drop even the strongest wastelander in seconds. Still, one item waits for us at the Sierra Madre, an item that has no real use and is out of the player's way just enough to go widely unnoticed by those who aren't looking for it. The embalming fluid. The only four jars of this substance in the game can be found in Salida del Sol North, at the Campanus del Sol. This room clearly acted as a morgue and chapel pre-war, and these jars are a reminder of the good old days. Embalming fluid prevents decomposition in bodies post-death in the real world. As for Fallout New Vegas, the substance has no use. It's not used in any quests, nor can it be crafted in anything. Seemingly, the jars were placed here for the ambience and to further identify the room. Whatever the case may be, rare item hunters will want to go out of their way to collect this four-of-a-kind find. Just don't think about what it'll cost you to get to the Sierra Madre in the first place. In Fallout 3, our search for unique items continues. While some sit ready for us to get our hands on them, others are hidden behind events that won't spawn into the game until specific criteria are met. One such weapon can be found if the Lone Wanderer targets the Citadel on the Enclave mobile platform, sealing its fate to be destroyed, leaving a crater behind. Inside the crater, we can see a door, and once we enter it, we find ourselves in some offices. One of the cubicles in the back belonged to a Herald Callahan, with a science skill of 75, we can read some of his reports and unlock the safe next to his desk, which is also locked at 75 for lockpicking. Inside the safe, we can find, without a doubt, the most valuable pistol in Fallout 3, which happens to be one of the rarest, Callahan's Magnum. Aside from being the most valuable, it is also the most powerful handgun in the game. The name Harold Callahan is a reference to the main character of the movie Dirty Harry, Harry Callahan, played by Clint Eastwood. While this gun is an excellent reference to the film, rare item hunters will want to grab it regardless due to the steps it takes to get it to spawn. A pleasant surprise for those who want to take an evil karma run all the way to the end. Thank you to Anthony from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we start our journey as a child growing up in Vault 101, going through major life events like our 10th birthday party, which is the time that young dwellers get issued their Pip-Boy, an exciting time indeed. After the party winds down a bit, Dad will get a call from Jonas. This prompts the adventure to the lower floors, where Dad gives us our first BB gun and a rad roach appears. One of the most easily missed voice lines in Fallout 3 happens right here, and believe it or not, it's from the Lone Wanderer themselves. Injuring the rad roach and walking away from it will trigger the player character to comment on losing the enemy. This is confirmed to be the Lone Wanderer by trying both the male and female characters, in which the voice actor will change to match. This is the only spoken voice line from the player character with actual words, not just grunts and moans. I guess it was nothing. I guess it was nothing. In Fallout New Vegas, you may stumble across a pretty curious sight when north of Good Springs. Chance's map, a crude depiction of the Mojave carved into the ground itself, could be something you have passed by. Sure, it's a marked location and the game will tell you that it's there, but after investigating it and taking the items you might want, the map doesn't seem to really hold much more of a purpose. To me, Chance's map is a memory, a celebration of one of the most disturbed great cons and his madness that led to his demise. We learn a bit more about Chance and the map in the All Roads graphic novel, which documents the lead up to Benny ambushing the courier. We see that Chance carved this map with his knife, which he later used to slaughter a whole gang of fiends at the nearby tribal village. After the battle, Chance would lose his life and the cons would carry on with Benny without him. All of these things are hinted at in-game as the tribal village, now infested with Cazadoras, sits at the bottom of an overlook that holds Chance's grave. Plundering the site will lead to finding Chance's knife. 
the blood of fiends still stained on the blade. So while some locations may just seem like a quirky post-apocalyptic set piece, remember that even the smallest places can have some of the biggest stories. Thank you to Draker the Heartbreaker from the Discord server for pointing me in the right direction on this one. In Fallout 3, the decimated capital wasteland hosts many things to discover. Broken streets, shattered buildings, but every once in a while, something in the waste can still function the way it used to. The fire hydrants that stand guard on the once busy suburban sidewalks fit this bill perfectly. As in Fallout 3, these hydrants can be activated, which will cause the lone wanderer to drink from them a task that doesn't make much sense considering what is needed to produce water from one of the pre-war devices. You would need a wrench or something similar and a working water supply. But this is a video game, so it can be overlooked as a fun source of HP at the cost of some rad levels. New Vegas, however, isn't buying into this idea. If we try to drink from the hydrants we find in the Mojave, the option will no longer be there. It's hard to say why the devs ultimately decided to cut this feature. Still, it could have been what I mentioned before, but the interaction just didn't make a whole lot of sense. So while you may be used to the flowing water of the capital hydrants, be wary in the Mojave. If you want a quick drink, a toilet would likely be a stronger candidate. Big thanks to Badaz Sasha from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout New Vegas, just on the cusp of the radiated Mesquite Mountains crater, we can find an overlooked, interesting two-story shack simply called Hell's Motel. One of the most noticeable things about this house on the edge of the crater is that we don't experience any radiation exposure on the inside, which is in contrast to the high amounts we receive just on the outside of the shack. Oh, and there's a dead ghoul on the ground. This is Dr. Rotson, and I assume he was killed by the crazed Mr. Handy here, which is a shame. We can see that Rotson was quite set up in his tiny home. Being a ghoul, the radiation and ferals outside would not pose a problem. He has a personal fungus farm outside and a distillery in the kitchen. This guy was set up for wasteland living. Around the house, we can find a few things like a star bottle cap, a weapon repair kit, and even a copy of the DC Journal of Internal Medicine. Inside the fridge, we can find some random irradiated food or drink, which is cool because this can create some ultra rare items that you won't find anywhere else, except for like maybe searchlight. Still, looting the doctor himself has a strange occurrence. When picking up the Wasteland Surgeon outfit and equipping it, and then moving to the effects tab, we can see it lists as Dr. Barrow's lab coat, who only appears in Fallout 3. This is likely because New Vegas was essentially built using a lot of assets from Fallout 3, per Bethesda, which would then be edited or changed to fit the Mojave as we can still find a ton of unused items from Fallout 3 in the game files for New Vegas. Hell's Motel may be a bit off the beaten path, but it's a fun stop during your journeys through the Mojave. In Fallout New Vegas, while in Freeside, we can come across Mick and Ralph's, a humble store on the edge of town that deals with guns and general items. Mick and Ralph know how to deal and are pretty in tune with the rest of Freeside, so they are an excellent place to go to get some things moving when in the area. If we speak to Mick, we can find out that the Omirtas in Gamora on the Strip have no longer been buying weapons from the store, which is hurting business. So Mick asks you to keep an eye out, which can lead to one of the best rewards in the game, especially for unique item hunters. This will involve starting the How Little We Know quest, and the easiest way to favor Mick and Ralph here is to just side with Big Sal and Nero over Kachino and help the bosses with their plans. Afterward, we can convince Big Sal to start buying from Mick and Ralph again. When we return to the store, Mick will be happy to hear the news about the Omirtas and offer us a new and improved Pip-Boy. The Pimp Boy 3 Billion. It's a pimped out version of the wrist device with a fancy coat of gold paint and shiny studs throughout the body. This is the only place we can get the Pimp Boy, and it is the only one we can find anywhere in the Fallout series, making this quite possibly one of the rarest items available, especially since the quest can be buggy, locking players out if they don't follow specific paths to a T. If for some reason you wanted the old model of Pip Boy back around your wrist, all you would have to do is talk to Mick again to switch the device. Personally, I feel there is no better way to show off your wealth in the Mojave than wearing this beautiful piece during the rest of your playthrough. In Fallout 2, one of the first companions you are likely to meet is Solik, an angry tribal who is now being held at the Buckners in Klamath after busting up the bar. Solik came to town to find Vic the traitor to get information on his missing sister, but when Vic wasn't around, Solik lost his temper. Doing quests for the Buckners or outright paying for the damages will allow Solik to join your party. The two of you set off into the wasteland for the adventure ahead, but no matter how long you look, you will never find Solik's sister. 
The quest, along with the two locations that were related to the Umbra tribe, were cut from the final game. Growing up, I always thought there would be a way to rescue the tribal sibling, with the Slaver's Guild in the Den being my prime suspect, and it turns out I wasn't so wrong after all. As with Killap's restoration patch, we can not only visit the tribe, but we can also complete their quests. When speaking to Metzger, if the Chosen One has speech above 51%, we can find out that the slaver has a camp outside of town where all of the new captives are taken. If we promise him a premium price, Metzger will give us directions. Once at the camp, we can handle things peacefully or we can have some fun. There is also a way to storm the place with NCR rangers. After the smoke is cleared, we can find Karisu, Solik's sister, inside of a shelter in the north area of the map. Speaking with Karisu will reunite the siblings and eventually lead to the cell door being unlocked, freeing all the captured souls that have found themselves here. Once back at the Umbra tribe, Karisu makes herself at home and Solik is silently grateful. It's a shame we didn't get all this in the final game. Still, the restoration patch turns our dreams into a reality and allows us to help Solik, one of the best companions in the Fallout universe. In the Fallout New Vegas DLC, Old World Blues, we find ourselves at the mercy of mad scientists turned post-apocalyptic robots in the Big Mountain facility. Dr. Klein and his group of wayward floating brethren have removed your spine, heart, and most importantly to this video, your brain. Because of this, we actually get some dialogue with what is essentially ourselves during the endgame of the DLC. One of the first things people notice about this brain is the voice. Many people relate it to the sound of Stewie Griffin from Family Guy. This is no coincidence as the voice actor, Sunil Mohathra, confirmed he based the character on the Family Guy star. Well, well, look who finally dragged themselves in out of the wasteland. And where have we been, hmm? Crawling through pits of radioactive muck again? If you are playing a female character, the voice will remain the same. But our brain does have an explanation for this. Ah, well, as to that, you'd be surprised how hard a feminine-sounding voice modulator is to find in the Forbidden Zone. It's not as though brain-sustaining life support tanks grow on trees. I had to take what I could get. It also seems our brain has picked up some tunes on the various ventures around the wasteland, as we can hear it hum the Begin Again song from the Dead Money DLC, which regularly plays on mysterious broadcast around Big MT. Begin again in the night. Let's sway. Get fucked. 